Welcome. In this class, we will talk about another important topic on environment that is ozone, the depletion of ozone, and the Montreal Protocol. Now, we'll start with the formation of ozone. So, when we talk about oxygen, I can say two molecules combine to form oxygen. However, when we talk about ozone, it is three atoms of oxygen that form ozone. So, we denote ozone by O3. That is the basic or the fundamental thing that we need to understand. Now, when we talk about formation of ozone, we must understand the oxygen ozone cycle first. So, what happens in the real world is you have oxygen that is present in the atmosphere. Now, this oxygen breaks down into free radicals. So, you have oxygen that breaks down into oxygen radicals. So, with each oxygen breaking down, there would be two oxygen radicals that would be formed. And in this process, there would be dissipation of heat. That heat would be in the form of kinetic energy. Now, these two free oxygen radicals would combine again with oxygen to form ozone. So, this is the process of formation of ozone and we call this process as photolyzation. However, there is recombination method that occurs and under recombination what happens is this ozone once formed again reacts with free radical of oxygen to form two molecules of oxygen. So, it is a kind of continuous process that happens in atmosphere where oxygen reacts with ozone radical to form ozone and this ozone again by the process of recombination breaks down into two free uh, two molecules of oxygen. So, again under this recombination reaction there is dissipation of heat that occurs and this heat is the main source of uh, kinetic energy in the atmosphere or the upper atmosphere. Now, when we talk about ozone, we need to understand that ozone is usually present in stratosphere from 15 to say 30 kilometers. However, uh, this ozone layer is useful to us because it protects the harmful ultraviolet rays that come from the sun to reach on the earth. So, it protects the harmful sunlight, uh, ultraviolet rays that reach the earth surface. However, this ozone if present in lower atmosphere is harmful. In upper atmosphere, it protects the harmful ultraviolet rays from reaching the earth. But in lower atmosphere, it is harmful. It can lead to various lung diseases. It can lead to asthma. It can create problems of uh, eye, particularly cataract and clouding of eyes. Then it can lead to various kind of skin diseases. However, when we talk about ozone protecting the ultraviolet rays, we must understand the various types of ultraviolet rays. So, there are typically three basic ultraviolet rays that we talk about. The UVA, B and C. UVA, the ultraviolet A is the longest in wavelength. Ultraviolet B is medium wavelength and this ultraviolet B is mainly protected by ozone. Ultraviolet A penetrates much deeper and since it has longer wavelength, 95% of the uh, ultraviolet is composed of ultraviolet A that reaches the earth. Ultraviolet C cannot filter through the atmosphere. It is a short wavelength, um, uh, sh it is of short wave wavelength, but it is most damaging and it is, it is confined to the upper layers of the atmosphere. Now, the ozone layer was first discovered in 1913 by French physicists Charles Freby and Henry Boyce. Now, when we talk about ozone, we must understand how do we measure it. So, Dobson unit is one of the measure methods by which we measure the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. If the amount of Dobson unit, we call them SDU, is less than 200, 
that means it is the region of ozone hole and this Dobson unit is a standardized measure to understand the uh, amount of ozone that is present in the atmosphere. Now in the recent years there has been discovery of ozone hole towards the Antarctica and this was mainly prominent in the spring. This was discovered by British physicist John Farman, Gardner and Shanklin uh, under a survey conducted in 1985. Now why does a ozone hole formation takes place and why it is predominantly towards the polar areas. These are the two questions that we will address as we move further. So the first thing is formation of or destruction of ozone layer. Now what happens in reality is we use chlorofluorocarbons as an ingredient in major refrigeration systems. Now this chlorofluorocarbon releases chlorine. Now the ultraviolet rays when reacts with chlorofluorocarbon releases chlorine radical. This free chlorine radical reacts with ozone to form chlorine monoxide and oxygen. Now again these chlorine monoxide react together and you have formation of oxygen that takes place again and this chlorine is again released as a free radical. Now again since this chlorine is re released as a free radical it would again react with ozone and again it would lead to breaking down of ozone. So this process would continue as we talked about in the recombination reaction and chlorine here acts as a catalyst or increases the rate of the reaction in this uh, process. So the, uh, the disintegration of ozone into oxygen and free radical of uh, oxygen, oxygen molecule and free radical of oxygen increases and you have a free radical of chlorine that is released every time and that continuously reacts with ozone leading to breaking down of the ozone layer. Now the second question that we will address here is why this takes mainly, uh, why this takes place mainly towards the polar regions. So you have the vortex of the winds that moves up at the pole and towards the pole it uh, kind of isolates from the stratosphere in the spring. So you have thin formations of ice, nitric acid and chlorine, um, methyl bromide and methyl chloride which takes place and that lead to uh, release of free chlorine and bromine uh, radicals which leads to breaking down of ozone and this is predominantly that happens during the spring season in uh, the polar areas itself. So as you can see in another imagery, you have the ultraviolet rays that come in. These break the chlorofluorocarbons and release chlorine. This chlorine combines with oxygen to form chlorine monoxide. The two oxygen, the free radical combines and form oxygen molecule and this chlorine is again left free to react with another molecule of oxygen. So this chlorine keeps on reacting with oxygen, uh, the ozone molecule forms chlorine monoxide which in turn forms oxygen molecule and again the chlorine is set free to really, uh, react with oxygen, uh, the ozone. So it leads to continuous breaking down of ozone particles. So that is again important. Now 16 September is observed as an international day to preserve the ozone. As we said there is breaking down of the ozone that takes place in presence of ultraviolet rays. However, when chlorine comes into picture it increases the rate of reaction. As a result, uh, if there is a creation of ozone hole it would take millions of years or I would say it would take decades and decades to uh, fulfill that gap. So there was an urgent need to reduce the amount of emissions uh, in the form of chlorine. As a result, uh, there were few uh, co uh, conventions that came into force and the most important of these were the Montreal Protocol. So what they tried to understand was the various sources of halogen based gases that is CFC, bromine, uh, methyl chloride, halons, methyl chloroform, uh, CCL4 that's carbon tetrachloride, methyl bromide and so on. When they react with uh, in presence of ultraviolet rays 
they lead to chemical reaction and formation of bromine nitrate hydrogen chloride and chlorine nitrate takes place however they are found in huge amount but are not so reactive the reactive ones are the free radicals of chlorine free radicals of bromine and formation of chlorine monoxide and bromine monoxide that takes place so these are these were discovered as the most reactive uh, gases which lead to highest destruction of the ozone layer as a result there was montreal protocol that came into force this montreal protocol was preceded by the vienna convention for protection of ozone in 1985 which talked about the harmful impact of ozone layer depletion and they said that the depletion of ozone layer would lead to incoming of harmful ultraviolet b radiations onto the earth surface considering the vienna convention montreal protocol came into force and it was mainly focused on the substances that delete the uh, that deplete the uh, ozone layer this was signed in 1987 and it came uh, into force from 1989 now this protocol uh, was mainly proposed to curb or ban the production of cfc there was another idea to substitute the chlorofluorocarbons to hydrochlorofluorocarbons that is that is hcfc and these were uh, less reactive and less um, they were less uh, i would say uh, harmful in comparison to the cfcs so these came into effect again there was a uh, idea to shift from cfcs Uh, and there was a deadline that was set for developed nations and the developing nations for developed nations it was suggested by 1995 they should curb the production of ozone depleting substances which they call as ods however this deadline was extended to 2005 for the developing nations so you had the deadline for developing and developed nations as separate later on there was uh, a ban on cfc and this ban talked about complete removal of the chlorofluorocarbons from refrigeration and aerosol industries as a result there were few developments that took place and the most important developments that you could see here as it started with the vienna uh, convention uh then you had the montreal protocol and the five amendments that took place in montreal protocol were at london copenhagen vienna uh montreal and beijing then they talked about the global consumption has been reduced by 98% by the year 2008 they talked about phasing out hydrofluorocarbons as well by 2007 and the global production of cfcs should end by 2010 were the main proposals under the montreal protocol as into force there were five amendments that came into force the montreal protocol itself and the vienna convention was ratified by 191 nations and you have the london copenhagen vienna montreal and beijing amendments ratified by the respective number of nations that i mentioned here now the london amendment the basic idea was to phase out chlorofluorocarbons and carbon tetrachloride so cfc and ccl4 were the main agenda in the london amendment the idea was to phase out these by 2000 in the developed nations and 2010 in the developing nations again they talked about the methyl bromide so they talked about phasing out of methyl bromide by 2005 in developed nations and 2015 in developing nations then you had the copenhagen amendment uh, the copenhagen amendment mainly talked about again uh, capping the methyl bromide production and methyl bromide should be completely phased out by 1991 as this amendment came into force into 1992 then you have montreal amendment that mainly focused on phasing out methyl bromide again uh, which was not which did not came into force into copenhagen amendment and they talked about phasing it out by 2005 and 2000 and 5 in developed nations and 2015 in developing nations and finally you had the beijing amendment which talked about uh, the uh, hydrofluorochlorocarbon should be phased out by 2004 
in developed nations in 2014 in developing nations so this was a basic idea about ozone how ozone is helpful in upper in the stratosphere however if it is present in lower atmosphere it proves to be harmful to human health uh, the process of formation and destruction of ozone and the montreal protocol will be covering few more important topics related to environment in the upcoming lectures you can subscribe to our channel for further details have a good day